Hi everyone, my name is John Doherty and in today's video I'm going to be showing you a, a product that I've built previously called GPBase. So the purpose of GPBase is to facilitate the easier booking of doctor's appointments. So here in the UK we have uh, uh, general practices where if you have a kind of less serious condition you can go and get it seen um, uh, by a doctor, so it's like a skin condition or um, I don't know like asthma stuff like that where it's um, kind of less serious um, and then the more urgent things would go to a and &E. um, In the UK uh, general practices are put under quite a lot of uh, pressure at the moment. Um, there's a lot of uh, pressure in the NHS here within the UK so the purpose of this uh, kind of product is to make it easier for patients to get seen and to kind of automate uh, as much as possible for the kind of back office type tasks related to getting a, an appointment. Um, at the moment, a lot of practices in the UK require a patient to ring up at nine o'clock in the morning and you have to wait on a phone line for up to an hour and you might not even get an appointment that day because there's so many people trying to get seen on the same day um, and a lot of the kind of difficulty is around the triage process where uh, the receptionists within these kind of practices are um, just overwhelmed with the demand and they can't uh, uh, handle that amount of people within such a short period of time with a limited amount of staff as well. So um, this product will try and automate the kind of triage process as well, make it uh, faster for patients to get seen. So I'll give you a quick overview of the product from the patient's perspective. So say I have uh, a cough and I want to get seen by my local doctors. I will search up my practice. I can see the details of my practice, you know, who's in the team, any notices that have been issued by my practice. I'll go ahead. Uh, I can also request a prescription. Um, so say I wanted, um, you know, some like cough medicine I've been prescribed. I can, you know, just request that through here rather than having to ring up my practice and request it, which can be very time consuming. And then I can just specify the pharmacy that I want to collect it at. And then I will actually want to go ahead and book an appointment this time because I want to see my doctor. So I just select that it's, you know, the cough category. Um, I'll just say like deep cough, um, green mucus. And I'll say I've had it for seven days now and I'll go ahead and I'll click next. So that appointment request is now being sent off to my practice and this uh, page I'm also provided the ability to upload any photos. So say it's a skin condition for example and it's easier to describe the symptoms with a photo. Uh, you can have the ability to do that here. Uh, might assist in the kind of triage process and kind of help expedite things. Um, so in this case, I don't. So I'm going to go ahead and click finish. And that's my appointment request sent off. And you can see that's with this data sub submitted now. So I'm going to show you the product from the perspective of the practice now. So if you're in the reception and you're managing all these appointment requests coming through, uh, this is kind of the web app that you'll be accessing so you can kind of get a you know an overview of the analytics uh, so you can see you know there's 81 appointments requested that day I can see you know the appointments by the state that they're in so you can see like uh, a lot of appointments are in the triage state 12 currently a wait in triage um, I can also view the wait time as well for patients so um, average wait time right now is 34 hours um, and I can also see stuff around the kind of prescription request so I'm going to take a look at the appointment that I requested a moment ago uh, so this one here so if I'm working in the reception I can quickly view the details of who the patient is I can view their symptoms that they've submitted and I can also assign this ticket to someone within the practice team and adjust the state um, 
and I can also assign a priority of how quickly they should be seen. Um, as well, you also have the ability to add comments, so there could be comments around previous medical history, um, stuff like that might assist in the kind of triage process. And then you've also got a timeline available, so you can see, uh, you know, what changes were made when and by who, and you know who it was assigned to as well. So let's say if I take a look at an appointment that's further along the process. Um, so let's say if I take a look at this one, for example, uh, you can see here that an appointment was booked for this request and I can see the timeline as well of when those changes were made. Um, so I'm going to send a booking invite to that patient, letting them know that it's okay for them, you know, to pop along to the practice. So I'll do this by just clicking the send booking invite button and the patient will receive an invitation in their email inbox of a link where they can uh, book. So I'm just going to show you that now quickly. So as a patient, I've received my booking invitation link. I can see the calendar here of when my doctor is next available. So it looks like my doctor is pretty busy at the moment. Uh, there's only one slot available right now, so I'm just going ahead and click and book this one. Um, I'll just go ahead and click confirm and then that will confirm the booking with the practice and I can just show up to my practice at that time and the patient will be emailed the reminder of when their appointment is and then if I'm in the practice and I want to manage the availability of this doctor I can you know see their calendar and see can I, I can see you know when their bookings have been made and I can also add additional availability for when patients can book more appointments essentially. Also as a kind of a staff member in the practice, I can manage the landing site of the practice page. So just details around like who's working on the team, opening hours, um, contact details, you know, holidays when the practice might be closed and any um, notices and you also have the ability to um, toggle feature flags off and on. So if they don't want the patients to have the ability to request prescriptions, for example, they can turn that off. So that's just a kind of quick overview of the product. And then next I'll be showing you the kind of architecture behind it. So just going to give you a quick overview now in terms of the architecture and how the product is actually working underneath the hood. I uh, just want to give you a link as well to the GitHub repository. So all these diagrams can be accessed in here. The GitHub repository will be posted in the description of the video. Feel free to check it out. Um, so I'll just give you a quick kind of architecture overview um, of how things are pieced together. So there are three web applications essentially one for the patient one for the staff working inside the practice and then one that's called internal so this would be an application that uh, i myself would use to view um side metrics around how the product is actually being used and any um you know say like user onboarding metrics stuff like that just so i myself know how the product is performing uh, so we've got those three web applications and they are using Next.js, uh, which basically provides support for server-side rendering. So why this might be important in this case is, um, say the patient web application, for example, um, it, with server-side rendering, it can make a search engine optimization a lot easier for bots like Google to crawl your website. So if you have a directory of say a thousand um, practices within the UK and you want to make the search super fast, you can do that. Um, where if you provide that server side rendering, it's very easy for the likes of a Google or a Bing to kind of crawl your site and extract out the information it needs for its own search engine. And then it bumps up your um, SEO ranking as well as a result so uh, Google provides a thing called a lighthouse score so you can see my SEO score is at 99 right now so it's nearly as high as it can possibly get 
um, and you can see that the performance as well is uh, very high across you know all those other metrics that uh, Google Lighthouse reports on. So all these kind of metrics would kind of feed in partially to how your website is actually ranked in terms of search results. Um, so that's kind of overview of the web applications. Um, everything is running inside a Kubernetes cluster. So I've done prior videos around setting up Kubernetes, stuff like Salary, Django. Um, so I have these services running on Kubernetes um, and uh, these web applications are communicating with my Django REST API. And I also have some salary workers running in the background as well. So the salary workers would assist in offloading processing and allow the ability to run tasks in the background. So just making the kind of overall user experience faster and less friction for the kind of patient ultimately. Um, in terms of the web applications as well they are integrated in with a thing called a CDN so a CDN is a content distribution network and these web applications would have static files uh, it could be stuff like images for example um, or it could be you know CSS files stuff like that um, if you use the CDN it basically means that your web applications load a lot faster for you know all regions across the world essentially so if your web app was international no matter what country you're in you're always going to get that super fast um, loading time so that's kind of a quick overview of the kind of services running inside kubernetes we're also using cloudflare to manage our kind of domains so uh, Kubernetes would have uh, ingresses and services that are hooked up to Cloudflare to point the traffic into a deployment essentially and then we also have um, some data stores as well so we have because we're using Celery we need a way to store uh, what's going to be in the queue of tasks to be processed and the results of those tasks so Redis and Rabbit Redis and Rabbit M MQ are basically for the salary service. So Rabbit MQ is storing what needs to be processed, and then Redis is storing the results of what was processed. We're also using Postgres, Elasticsearch, and S3. So Postgres is kind of a, you know like a widely used relational database. Uh, it integrates quite well with Django. S3 is a basically a giant online hard drive where you can you know easily store files where it could be I don't know like images so previously I showed you where a patient had the ability to upload a file when a patient uploads a file it generates a pre-signed URL that gets stored in the bucket and Elasticsearch is what's powering the search engine within the web application so as I previously showed you um, there is that fast instantaneous search for practices and Elasticsearch is what is actually storing the index of all those practices and allows that instantaneous um, search result to come back which is quite nice for the end user and then in terms of kind of external tools uh, so Datadog is being used to report on how these services are performing. So I can go in and see, um, you know, logs of any kind of errors that have been raised um, or any downtime related problems. Datadog's great for kind of uh, tracking those kind of metrics. Um, Auth0 is being used for the authentication. So Auth0 just kind of takes away a lot of the kind of heavy lifting for creating your own authentication service. It's quite nice out of, out of the box functionality and can kind of assist in getting like a, you know, MVP or prototype out the door a lot faster without having to think about that kind of stuff, which is nice. Um, the open API is also being used to generate um, API documentation. So because I'm using the Django REST API, I can generate schemas automatically um, because of these Django REST serial serializers, which is quite nice. Um, and I'm also using GitHub, which is standard Google Maps, just for displaying the map and the practice, and also mail gun to email the patient. So that's just a kind of quick overview of the practice and 
you know, some of the kind of SEO stuff. Um, and there's a couple of other diagrams here just around the kind of release process, how the build and deploy process is working, and also how the Elastic Index stuff is working underneath the hood. Uh, you know, you can feel free to check out these diagrams on the GitHub repository in your own time. And I uh, just gave you kind of a quick breakdown of the costs. So right now, um, for me to run this product, to have both a staging environment and a production environment, uh, it costs about £1,500 a month. Um, and I, the people would say, oh, you could do that cheaper. You know, you could use something like, I don't know, Heroku, for example. But the problem there with Heroku is that um, whenever you're using their kind of free tier stuff like that, in order for them to save compute time, they'll switch off your servers and you've got this uh, cold start problem where API requests can take longer because the server has to boot up essentially. Um, but with all this kind of infrastructure that I've previously described, it is very kind of enterprise grade level kind of stuff. Um, it'd be kind of quite advanced, you know, beyond the kind of uh, prototype or MVP stage, which, you know, something like Heroku is great for. Um, but with this kind of infrastructure, it makes it, um, you know, highly reliable service and it's not going to be going down. And I also have the statistical evidence to prove that things are running 24 seven without any problems with a observability platform like Datadog essentially. Um, you can do things cheaper by only having one environment, but you also run the risk of, um, you know, introducing bugs to your production environment more frequently as a result of that. So things can be done cheaper, but it's not always the best scenario. Um, and this is for an application that is, you know, quite light in terms of uh, network traffic. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of quick overview of the kind of architecture and the kind of cost to run this product. And that's with uh, DigitalOcean. So you can use AWS or GCP, of course. Um, uh, with AWS and GCP, I would find that their services would be a bit more expensive than DigitalOcean. Um, so DigitalOcean um, offers a managed Kubernetes service. Um, but this managed Kubernetes service is a lot more expensive to run on AWS and GCP. So that's why I've uh, went with DigitalOcean in this case to kind of save cost essentially. And then we, yeah, there's those other diagrams as well. You can feel free to check them out and I'll include a link in the description in terms of the source code where you can step through the infrastructure, see how things are and see the, how the REST APIs work and stuff. Uh, I'm going to be covering in future videos stuff around uh, dependency injection, um, factories. Uh, there's, uh, you know, Elasticsearch indexes going on in there. So I'd recommend, you know, just stepping through the code base and, you know, getting a feel for how the product is working.